Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and, uh, I, I give up. Uh, I am not going to be making a video about DDR5-8000 on Intel 13th Gen, because as far as I'm concerned, it is impossible to stabilize. I have spent way too much money and way too much time trying to do something that never works. Ever. Um... So right here, we have a perfect example of it where it's just like, oh look, Whitecruncher VST uh, is crashing. Uh, earlier today, with somewhat tighter memory timings, as in uh, 15, 7, 13, 7, uh, earlier today, that actually passed Whitecruncher VST, and then it crashed out in test mem 5. Um, so, you know, I was like, okay, well, test mem 5 hits the memory harder than Whitecruncher VST does, so if we just loosen out the timings a bit, uh, test mem 5 will pass, and Whitecruncher will be happy. Except that didn't happen, because as you can see, Whitecruncher isn't, f f like, Whitecruncher doesn't pass. And so it's like, so the Intel memory controller is incredibly cursed. But it gets uh, even better, because I have multiple screenshots of across various systems. So uh, I think this is, yeah, so this is right now. Um, here's a uh, earlier one, which was just... Th this is the one where I truly wanted to give up, because, um, yeah, look, Whitecruncher passed, HCI uh, test mem 5 passes, guess what errors out? HCI mem test at a thousand percent. It finds two errors. Now, you know, uh, just for fun, after th these two errors, I started a second HCI mem test instance, and that instance found another two errors in 500%. Um, this is with literally some of the loosest timings I've tried, um, with, you know, like, admittedly pri tighter primary timings than what I'm running right now, but uh, end result is it wasn't freaking stable, was it? Um, and I think there's an earlier screenshot of more of the same, um... No, this is just like, yeah, this is just some random pre-testing. Also, could you go away? Thank you. Um, what's this? Oh. Oh, oh, no, go away. Man, using the mouse through the capture card is not fun. Oh, yeah, this is uh, DDR, an attempt at DDR5-8000 on the MSI Z17, uh, Z790i Edge Wi-Fi. Um... Yeah, that, that went great, um, though I think that was with, like, too much mounting pressure, which is, which is the real kicker, because the LGA 1700 socket is, like, if you apply too much mounting pressure, you get memory errors. You don't apply enough mounting pressure, you get memory errors. You just, like, and the, you might be like, oh, the stock loading mechanism is good enough. On some motherboards, yes. On some motherboards, no. And then it also depends on how much you tighten your, your heatsink down on top of that, and, and just, uh... I hate it, I hate it, I, like, I absolutely hate the Intel 13th gen memory controller. Now, if we zoom in on this screenshot, man, the freaking default Photos app in Windows is terrible. Um, wait, is this the one? Oh, no, so this is, uh, oh, yeah, this is the Kingston kit, and this is 7800. Um, but if I remember correctly, I started a 10-cycle test mem 5 instance because I had, like, an error in a, like, four cycle? Yeah, I think I got an error in four cycles, and so then I was like, well, okay, is it like a thermal issue? And so I ran test mem5 way longer. And that passed. Because <laughs> of course it did. Because th this memory controller is just completely insane. Um, oh, here we have... Uh, I think this would be the Z790i Unify. No, this is the dark at 70. Oh, no, this is dark at uh, uh, 8000, and Whitecruncher just immediately implodes on every single core. Imagine that. So, basically, I, I, I give up. I, I just, like, no. This, this, this isn't, this isn't an option. Like, it can't, like, no. Like, th this is just absolutely no. Because the thing is, when I do these memory overclocking videos, um, I have sort of two goals. Um, or, well, when I do memory overclocking videos showing, like, stable memory settings, my goal is to have settings where it's like, I would trust this on my daily system. Okay? Um, and that means, and, w well, actually, not even, like, my daily system, because my daily system actually isn't, like, stress-tested to the standards that I would, like, give to somebody where I don't, know what their end use case is, because that's kind of the, like, 
a stable system, okay, th this is the only valid definition of a stable system, is a system that can run arbitrary, valid code for indefinite amounts of time, okay? Which means you can run, like, Ycruncher forever. You can run testmem5 forever. You can run HCI memtest forever, okay? If your system, or you can run prime95 forever. You can run linpack forever. Um, that would be true stability. Now, I'm not necessarily a subscriber that every system has to be 100% stable. My personal daily system, the system that's currently recording this video, can't survive more than a couple seconds of Prime95 small FFTs. And that is a level of instability I am willing to tolerate. Um, but my, my personal system doesn't throw errors in HCI memtest, it doesn't throw errors in test mem5, and it can run linpack overnight. It's like, so I consider it stable enough for my own uses. Um, and the fact that it can't handle Prime95 small FFTs for more than a few seconds because it's on air cooling and it just overheats after a few seconds, I'm okay with that. But I wouldn't go and, like, if somebody asks me, hey, Buildzoid, could you overclock my system? Like, if I don't know what they plan to do with their system, I can't give them a system where it's like, oh, it won't run, like, there's this one workload that I know for sure it'll just not run for more than a couple seconds. And so with the 13th gen memory controller, like, it errors like five seconds into Ycruncher VST, or actually sometimes it errors five seconds into freaking test mem5, which, which just, like, it's so inconsistent, right? Which is why I've also like been steadily like creeping the stress test durations with DDR5 for, for Intel systems, because I am sick and tired of like, I will run HCI mem test overnight. I wake up like, or yeah, this actually happened where it's like, I ran test mem5, and Ycruncher, and, well, Ycruncher passed, test mem5, I think, got, like, an error or two, and then for fun, I wanted to see if, like, you know, like, how, how bad is this instability? So I ran HCI memtest overnight. When I woke up, um, there was 90 errors in HCI memtest. Um, just, like, a random blob of 90 errors. W which just doesn't make any bloody sense. Like, if it was a thermal issue, you would think it would keep getting worse and worse and worse over time as the, you know, system heats up. Um, but no, this was just like a random batch of 90 errors. Because like, for I guess a couple seconds, or for like a millisecond, the memory controller forgot how to read data or something. Because that's what it feels like. It just randomly loses stability. Sometimes it happens within several, within a couple seconds. Sometimes it ap happens after three hours. Also, I have a sneaking suspicion that depending on which order you run your stress tests in, they fail or don't fail. Like, run Ycruncher first, test mem5 will probably fail. Run test mem5 first, Ycruncher will fail. Run, and if they don't, <laughs> if those two don't fail, and then you run HCI mem test indefinitely, it will fail. And it's just like... Like, this is completely stupid. And changing the voltages doesn't do anything. Changing the timings doesn't do anything. Like... It, and, and the, like... The, the, so, so, like, I can't make a video where it's like, oh yeah, these settings work on this motherboard, and they're, like, stable, and they won't randomly crash on you, because I don't know. The stability randomly comes and goes. Sometimes it's incredibly stable, like, incredibly unstable. Sometimes it isn't. Um, and the, the worst part is, is, like, sometimes the stability seems to just, like, implode after multiple hours of stress testing. Um, as in, it's like, it was stable, and then it isn't. And, and, cause, like, I, what I've done is, like, I, you know, like, I'd get some errors in one instance of a stress test, so I open, so I'd stop that instance, open a new instance, and run that, and then it's like, oh, it's, it's getting more errors, and now they're showing up faster. But, like, the system's cool, like, it, it's... Just like no, like I, I am, I am, like I am completely sick and tired of this. This is a complete waste of time. Um, to add, like, and, and to add, sort of like, uh, like, and to further, like, drive home my point about this is a complete waste of time. Um, like Steve from uh, Hardware Unboxed recently did some uh, ben me like game benchmarks with uh, tuned memory timings. So we're going to take a look at those. Um, 
right? So he ran these benchmarks. And the difference between DDR5 7200, which on some other boards with some CPUs won't work, by the way, fun fact, <laughs> like at all, um, or actually, well, no, if you spend forever tuning voltages, you can sometimes get it to work. But a lot of the time, just enabling XMP at DDR5 7200 on a Z790 motherboard prob may or may not work. And the same is true for a lot of Z690 boards. Because sometimes you'll get a 13 13th gen CPU, like for example my 13900K, which just has a memory controller so incredibly bad that it can barely do 7200. Um, actually, I don't know if that CPU can actually do 7200, because I've never run a full pass of stress tests on it, and I don't want to. Okay? I really don't want to. I do not enjoy seeing errors show up after 10 hours of stress testing. Um... Especially when there's, like, nothing I can really do about them, because the errors are completely random. The stability comes and goes on a freaking whim. Um, and on, like, and you might be like, well, Buildzoid, maybe you're... No, it's like, if I do the same thing with a Ryzen system, if it runs 500% HCI mem test, it'll run two days of HCI mem test. And I've done that with Ryzen 7000. The, the, the memory time, like, the easy uh, Hynix memory timings for a Ryzen 7000 video, those timings... I run them to like 2,000% on some combinations of motherboard, memory, and, and CPU, because, it, like, I forgot to, like, I wanted to record the video, and I usually stop the stress test recording before recording a video, and basically I just, like, didn't get around to recording the video for, like, two days. Um, and so, yeah, there, there was, like, HCI mem test with, like, 2,000% coverage. No errors. I've never seen that on an Intel system once you push the memory because it just randomly stops being stable. You don't even need to power cycle it. Which brings up the other really fun issue with Intel systems, which is that if you power cycle some of them enough times, eventually the memory controller just does something stupid and your stability just disappears. And then it may or may not come back if you power cycle the system a few more times again. And it's just like, and you might be like, oh, if you just skip memory training, that'll stop happening. No, no, that doesn't actually work. Skipping memory training do doesn't really change whether or not the stability comes and goes between reboots. Though I will say on Ryzen systems, if you have the skip, uh, uh, what is it, the memory context restore? Yeah, don't don't turn that on if you're pushing the memory because it, especially on some, like, like on some motherboards, it'll cause the memory, con like the memory controller will train settings that are like barely good enough once. And then the next time you restart, uh, and then if you restart the system a few times, the, the settings won't be good enough anymore. So the memory context restore, which drastically reduces boot times, actually causes like memory instability in my experience with like overclocked memory. So that is something you should potentially disable. Um, but on Intel systems, like it doesn't matter if you skip memory training or don't because the stability just disappears for no reason uh, whenever it just kind of feels like it. Um, anyway, let's pull up the calculator. So the reason I pulled up the, these graphs from Hardware Unboxed um, is because uh, DDR5-6000, right? is 223 FPS on average, uh, with an RTX 4090 at 1080p, and DDR5-7200 with tuned timings is 228 FPS on average, um, at, again, with a 4090 at 1080p, which is a difference in performance of 2.2%, because... Yeah, like, memory speed doesn't actually translate into performance. You get a pretty significant performance uplift from adjusting the memory timings, right? If you go from uh, XMP DDR5-7200, you go from, uh, what is it, like, 228 versus uh, 217 here, right? Which is a 5% increase from adjusting timings, but, like, DDR5-6000 with tuned timings is actually faster than DDR5-7200 XMP. And DDR5-6000 with tuned memory timings is easier to run than DDR5-7200 with, with an XMP profile, depending on how bad your CPU is and how bad your motherboard is. And... Uh, you know, like how much socket mounting pressure you have and what the alignment of the sun and moon is like right now. And it's just, I hate the 13th gen memory controller. Um, it's so random. Um, yeah. And, and the real kicker is, like, you don't even gain a bunch of performance. Because here, like, going from 6,000 to 7,200, that is a speed increase of 20%. That is 20% more clock speed. Going from 7,200 
to 8,000, right? Which 8,000 is like absolutely just nightmare fuel to stabilize. That's an 11% increase in, in, in clock speed. Uh, it'll probably translate to a performance increase of like 1%-ish. Because right now we're getting, what is it? Like one point, because um, it's what, 228 versus uh, 223. Right, and admittedly, there are some games that see bigger gains. I think there was like Spider-Man. Actually, that doesn't really see very big gains. That's one eight one versus what is it, one seven six? So that's like two point eight percent. Yeah, so that sees slightly higher gains than on average because this is a very memory sensitive game, um, or relatively memory sensitive game. If we look at Callisto Protocol, that didn't change at all. So we're just going to ignore that. Uh, Plague Tale, uh, that's what, 161 versus five, uh, 156? That's may as well be the same thing. I th that's like 3%. Okay, so that saw some more improvement than Spider-Man did. Uh, if we go Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, there. Uh, okay, so Horizon Zero Dawn actually just like scales negatively with memory speed, which is, which is great. Um, <laughs> we get Rift Breaker. Oh, there we go. Something that actually seems to scale with memory speed. So we'll take that. Right, as our like best case scenario. I'm, I'm going to give Intel's memory controller the benefit of the doubt here. Um, actually, did that even scale? Yeah, that's like three, almost 3.8%. Um, so, and then we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is, well, like, that might be more. 317 divided by 310. Now that's 2.2%. So that's exactly the same as the like seven game average here. And then we have Watch Dogs Legion, which that that looks like two and a half percent at a glance. Um, one nine nine, yeah, that's like three percent. Yeah, so I was pretty close. So the across these games, like the one that saw the most scaling was like almost four percent, um, and that's from a twenty percent clock speed increase. And I botched this math once before, and I'm probably going to do it again. But let's say so we have like one point four percent. Right, you have a 4% increase due to a 20% increase in clock speed. Hopefully I'm doing the math right. I'm probably not. No, I'm not. Yeah. Okay, we'll just do it the hard way. We'll just take 4% divided by 20%. Right, so you get 0.2% per 1% of memory clock. So if we multiply that by our 11% increase, you'd get another 2.2% by going from 7,200 to 8,000, right? Because 8,000 uh, compared to 7,200 is 11%. Um, yeah, that's just like total waste of time and effort. Like you don't even get like, so for all of this instability, for all of this wasted time running stress tests that just inevitably crash for no apparent reason, you get 2% of performance. Maybe. Oh, and that's not accounting for the, the fact that, like, your timings get looser as you keep increasing the memory clock, so... <laughs> you know, that's... It might not even be that... Like, the, the scaling is probably not even going to be linear. It'll be probably slightly less than linear, so you won't get a... Like, yeah, your memory clock will go up 11%, but you won't proportionally get the same increase in... Uh, in, in performance as you did going from 6,000 to 7,200. And it's just like... Like, this This is just stupid. Like, it's a complete waste of time. Um, it makes barely any difference to, end like, the, the performance at the end. Um, it's absolute nightmare fuel in terms of, like, time investment. And, like, I can't see any reason to like to to like try continue with this um yeah because yeah it's it's a just total waste of time as far as i'm concerned um i guess you might be like wondering uh so i guess we'll go over some of my experiences with with various motherboards that i've tried in my uh, quest for DDR5-8000, or really just any, like, impressive-ish DDR5 clocks with, with, Intel, uh, with uh, Intel CPUs. 
Um, I'll just go, actually no, I wanted to. Is there an option? Yeah, DDR5. There we go. So let's see. Um, I don't have one of those, so I don't know how good that board is. It probably sucks because it has too many dim slots. I don't have one of those, so I don't know how that does. I did try my potato grade 13900K on a Z690 formula, and this was on an early BIOS, and it didn't work above 6800. This board literally wouldn't go above 7600 with any amount of stability in Y-Cruncher VST until a relatively recent BIOS update. On that BIOS update, I still haven't managed to get more than 7800 to work, though I haven't tried the 13900KS that I have on the latest BIOS, because the 13900KS that I have should have a better memory controller than the 13600K, though, yeah, um, I, like, I haven't tested that yet, but I don't have high expectations. Uh, also, I sh probably shouldn't have used UK PC Part Picker just because we don't seem to have a complete lineup of boards here. Um, 690, don't have that, don't have that, don't ha uh, Well, I do have that. That didn't go well with the Potato 13900K, which I'm blaming on the 13900K. I don't think that was the board's fault. That 13900K is just so incredibly bad. Like, that 13900K, even on the Z790 Dark Kingpin, can't do 7600. Um, cause it's just, it's just bad. Like, that CPU is terrible. Um, anyway, then we've got the Z690 Aorus Extreme. I didn't bother trying that. Don't have one of those. Don't have one of those. Don't have that. So I haven't tried that either. Uh, don't have that. Don't have that. Uh, I do have this, but I didn't try it. It probably sucks. Um, cause that's like a, actually, it's probably kind of similar to the Z790 Aorus Elite AX. Uh, which means 7200 will probably be quite difficult even on a c CPU that can actually do 7200. The potato grade 13900K will probably stop at 6800. I um, uh, haven't tried that board. Don't have that. Don't have that. Did try this. Uh, really, like, I don't know, maybe some BIOS updates have made this board significantly better since I last tried it, but when I last tried it, it was basically the same experience as a Z790 or a Elite AX. Uh, so 7200 is potentially very difficult depending on how bad your CPU is. Uh, Gigabyte QVLs the board up to like 7800 or something silly like that. I have serious doubts that you will reliably get any any memory speed that high to actually work, uh, at least if you're planning to run something more than like HCI memtest. Um, so, yeah, anyway, then we have the Asus Strix Z790i. I don't have one of those, so maybe that's good. Um, this is probably a decent board just because it's a one dim per channel and not a two dimmer. I mean, a, a two dim per channel board. Uh, then we have the Z790, Z690 Ace. I don't have one of those, so I don't know how that behaves. This is another four dimmer, so I don't know. Don't have that. Don't have that. Don't have that. Do have this. I tried this with the Potato Grade 13900K. Literally wouldn't post above 7200. Uh, and with my 13600K, I think 7466 kind of looked like it might work, maybe, uh, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, um, that's kind of that. Don't have one of these, so don't know how that behaves. Uh, I don't think I have one of those. No, I don't have one of those. I have the Z690 Aorus Pro, which is a 6 layer PCB and, like, the same memory topology, but... Um, I, like, I haven't tried that. I would assume it'll behave similar to the Z790 or S Elite, because I don't think Gigabyte actually changed their memory topology between Z690 and Z790. Um, anyway, let's keep going. Don't have one of those. Don't have that. Don't have that. Uh, do have that. I haven't... No, I d don't have it in DDR5. I have it in DDR4. Um, so I haven't tried that, don't have that. Do have this, uh, easily, like, if your CPU doesn't suck, then it will do 7600, and then above 7600, you can very quickly forget about getting Y-Cruncher VST to pass reliably. Uh, other stress tests may pass up to even 8000 if you get lucky, but, um, yeah, also this is the board that really, like, like, I tried uh, washer modding it, it really didn't like that. Like, there was no amount of, like, extra mounting pressure that I could apply through the uh, CPU mounting hardware, like, well, heatsink mounting hardware that would fix that. The That board only, like, works properly if you use the stock loading mechanism. Maybe a contact frame wouldn't have that many issues as a washer mod, but, yeah, I, I don't have any contact frames on hand, so can't test that. But that board seems to really not like it if you swap out the... Uh, integrated loading mechanism, or reduce the loading mechanism's mounting pressure. Um, don't have that. Do have this. This stopped at 6800 with the potato grade 13900K. Uh, don't have one of those. Don't have one of those. Don't have that. 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 Uh, don't have that either. Uh, there's a lot of motherboards that I don't have, so <laughs> makes this kind of difficult. Um, 
And the the other thing is like at this point I don't even want uh, more boards because I have a Z790 Aorus Tachyon, I have a Z690 Tachyon, a Z690 Unify X. Uh, and the two Tachyons, uh, well, the Z690, I actually kind of had 7600 working, uh, with the 13600K, again, the 13900K that I have, it's, it's trash, like, I'm pretty much convinced that that CPU doesn't do 7600, period, um, and, uh, the Z790 Tachyon, it will do 7800, probably, um, which is about on par with the Z790 Dark, and that's both of those are better than the ITX Edge for me. Um, so, because, yeah, I tried to do 7800 on the, the ITX uh, MSI board. And it's like, if you put a lot of effort into it, it might work. But I never got around to the point where it's like, oh, it passes every stress test that I want to pass. It's always been in the similar situation as 8000 on the Tachyon is right now. Where it's like, I can get two out of three stress tests to pass, but never all three. Like, I cannot get HCI mem test and Y Cruncher and Test Mem 5 to pass at the same time. I can do two of them, but not all three. And that's not good enough, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, yeah. Uh, like, obviously, I haven't tested, like, an exhaustive list of uh, Z790 motherboards. Um... It's only very recently that I got a DDR5-7800 rated memory kit, but that memory kit behaves very similarly to the 7200 rated kits that I had before. Um, actually, well, one of the two 7200 memory kits I have is actually definitely worse, but um, once you get up into the really high speeds, the like stability randomly coming and going is is very consistent across every combination of hardware I've tried, with, of course, the exception of the Potato Get Raid 13900K, because that just isn't stable. Um, it, it just isn't. There's nothing you can do. It never, ever gets better. Um, so, yeah, and, like, I, like, I'm, I'm making this video because, like, I, I give up. Um, I've put way too much time and arguably too much money into this because like I bought the ITX MSI board um, and the main reason I bought that board is partial like well partially it's like I like the thing I don't like about requesting review samples is that when you end up you know like I, I don't like being negative about stuff and it's even worse when when it's like free review samples where it's like yeah everything because, like, my current judgment on Intel DDR5 memory overclocking is, like, everything sucks. Like, nothing is consistent. Um, stability randomly comes and goes on literally every single board that I've tried. Um, and, yeah. Um, the only motherboard that I sort of have, like... High, like even higher expectations for than what I've tested so far would be the Z790 Apex, but I don't have one, and that board is like eight hundred dollars, and I kind of question the, you know, like utility of the information that yeah, there's this one eight hundred dollar motherboard that does DDR5 eight thousand, like that's cool, but how is that even remotely practical? It's an $800 board. Um, and I also don't have one. So I actually don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe it isn't that much better. Like, potentially it would be just as bad as my experience with everything I've tested so far. Um, because, yeah, like, it's just like... like, And I've tried, like I mentioned, I've tried less mounting pressure, more mounting pressure, cleaning the memory sticks. Like... I've tried every trick in the book that I've ever used from to, to get better memory overclocking out of any platform that I've ever worked with. And with, like, Intel 13th Gen, once you go past, like... And it depends on the CPU, but once you go past a certain speed, the stability just kind of vanishes and doesn't come back. Um, yeah. And admittedly, you know, like... Some people, like, and this is one thing I, like, almost regret, is, like, this test right here, where it's, like, 
you know, it, it passed Y Cruncher VST. That that's an hour, like that's over an hour of Y Cruncher, and then it passed two and a half hours of Test Mem Five, and then it's like if I just stopped HCI Mem Test at seven hundred percent, there wouldn't have been any errors, right? Like there wouldn't have been any errors to 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 look at, and I'd be like, oh yeah, this is stable. But the reason I've been sort of letting HCI mem tests just run out to these ridiculous percentages is because I've done that with Ryzen and it's fine. Um, now, yeah, Ryzen runs at significantly lower memory clocks, but the Ryzen memory controller also doesn't post above like 6400. Actually, depending on the CPU, some of them don't boot at 6400 at all, right? So it's like, um, like in a way, the best like the best way I can describe the difference between a Ryzen 7000 memory controller and a like an Intel 13th gen memory controller is an Intel 13th gen memory controller will boot pretty much anything. Like I can go all the way up to like 8400 and run Geekbench 3. It'll never pass a stress test at that point, but I can run Geekbench and I can boot even higher speeds than that. Um, so there's like this huge gap between the speeds that are very easily, like, stabilizable, which would be, like, 7600, 7800, 7200. Again, it depends on, on the platform. And, you know, the speeds where you can run benchmarks, like, you're going well over 8000 on a lot of these one DIM per channel motherboards. Like, the Z790 ITX from MSI, that'll run Geekbench at 8200. Um, the Z790 Dark will run Geekbench at 8400. The Tachyon will run Geekbench at 8400. I actually haven't tried more than 8400 on the Tachyon yet. Um, but yeah, like, it'll run Geekbench at 8400, and then it's like, oh, I would actually like to, like, not crash in, uh, stress tests, and it's like, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> 7800 maybe? Um, it's just, like, and, and the performance gains are so, like, like, you know, and outside of synthetic benchmarks, like, yeah, the performance gains are negligible because most of the performance gain, as always, comes from the memory timings, not the raw memory speed. Because the only thing the memory speed on it, like, if, if you just crank up the memory speed and let the leave all the timings on auto, all that happens is your peak bandwidth improves. And peak bandwidth is really misleading because it requires a very, or like, it's not a very useful measurement because it requires that the data in the memory is organized in a very specific way and then accessed in a very specific way. If your data is randomly strewn throughout the memory kit, like strewn throughout the, the memory banks of the, the memory sticks, and you're just doing random accesses, like, you know, most regular workloads probably do, Peak bandwidth is never achieved. Like, look at this HCI, um, HCI mem test run. It's 43 gigabytes per second. And actually, if I run HCI mem test right now, and we're, we're going to quickly run, like, IDA, and HCI mem test isn't even, like, a, a true random memory bandwidth test. Um, but compared to IDA, it may as well be, because, like, or, well, it, it's more random than the IDA memory bandwidth. So if we run IDA's read test... We're going to see like 127 gigabytes per second, which incidentally is physically impossible because um, uh, this, this is a 128-bit memory controller and it's ru running at 8,000 megabits per second. So if we multiply our bus width by our data rate, uh, we end up with uh, that number and then you divide it by 8 to get your bytes. And uh, actually, wait, we're getting that. Oh, so it's not, not quite over that. So we're... we're... Wait... Oh, I closed Ida. Oops. Either way, we're like right up against the theoretical max throughput. Yeah. So, anyway. Okay, so we're not violating the max memory bandwidth right now. But on certain platforms, if you run the, the read bandwidth, it'll actually just spit out numbers that are physically impossible. Um, anyway, if we run the copy test... Uh, we're going to get like over 100 gigabytes, yeah, 120 gigabytes per second, which is fine. That that doesn't violate any um, laws of physics. Um, but if we run, you know, uh, not test mem, hell, uh, where's HCI? There's HCI. Um, 
and we just run that on 16 threads at like, I don't know, like I'm not going to use full uh, full capacity right now. It's going to take a while to ramp up. So we're probably going to see something like 48 gigabytes per second, 47, actually maybe less than that. Yeah, so we're getting like 47 gigabytes per second. Right? And so... And th this is like a full, like, a memory test, which basically means it's just like reading and writing continuously to the memory sticks. It's just not, sequ like, a ideal best-case scenario read-write operation. And so the memory bandwidth is way lower than you, than you would see in something like IDA. Um... And that's sort of the reason why, like, memory speed alone doesn't really improve performance very much, because when you crank up the memory speed, all of your actual, like, timing delays stay the same, right? So, like, how long, um, like, that's why, like, your primary timings go up as your memory speed increases, is it, in, in terms of actual nanoseconds, the time to complete various operations stays roughly the same, um, and... Then you also have, like, your various back-to-back -back timings, which also go up as you increase memory speed. Uh, so, yeah, you don't really get, like, your... You don't get, like, a general performance boost. You get, like, a really heavy increase in peak bandwidth, and then your sort of random access performance doesn't really change that much. So tuning your memory timings makes more of a difference than, like, an XM a high-speed XMP profile pro will ever really make because peak bandwidth just isn't, like, re like it's just not achieved by most workloads under most circumstances, right? So, like, usually you're not going to be going, you know, constant, like, you're not going to be continuously hitting the read-to-read -read different group timing or the write-to-write -write different group timing, um, right? If your memory was continuously only hitting read-to-read -read different group and write-to-write -write different, uh, different group you get peak bandwidth. Um, if you're doing, you know, if you're hitting the same group timings, well, there's a penalty for that. If you're uh, opening rows and closing rows at random, then you're constantly going to be hitting TRCD and TRP and uh, TCL and potentially TRAS as well, um, depending on what your TRAS is set to. Uh, and so that that's like that drags the performance down. Right? And, and that's why like any like any benchmarks that you should see where people are like, oh yeah, the like high-speed XMP memory kits don't really make much of a performance difference. Yeah, because the, the timings are still roughly the same. Um, and your yeah, your peak bandwidth is way ha higher than ever before, but you don't generally use peak bandwidth. That's just not a thing. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so it's like, I'm not, you know, like, like, I, I'm, I'm just, like, done with this. Because, like, if I was actually setting up a 13th gen system for, like, day-to-day -day use, I would just give up the moment I, you know, like, the, the moment Y-Cruncher VST just crashes within, like, the first three loops, that is a pretty good indication that you're going to need to put a ton of time into getting Y-Cruncher VST to stop crashing instantly. Um, and it's just so much easier to lower the memory speed. And then, you know, work on the timings, which there's not actually that many timings on the Intel memory controller that are relevant to a single rank memory configuration, right? You've got, like, cast latency, TRCD, TRCDWR, TRP, TRAS, uh, command rate, which command rate, like, 1T is generally a bit faster, 2T is a lot easier to stabilize, so I usually stick to 2T because 1T uh, can be a massive pain. Um... Then you get, like, TRRD, SG, DG, TRFC. This isn't really a very important timing if your refresh interval is high enough. And by high enough, I mean, once you go past, like, 50,000, the refresh cycle really stops mattering very much because you just don't refresh that often. So how long you actually spend on the refresh stops being relevant. TWR isn't a timing that actually exists, which is why, the, why this app isn't able to read it right now. Uh, TRTP is uh, relevant, um... 
not really that it makes much of a difference to performance, but it is a timing that actually exists and does something. TFAW is a timing that do, uh, exists and does things. TCKE is a timing that also exists and does things. TCWL is another timing that exists and does things. Then you have like TRRD, SG, DG, um, uh, and then like read to write, uh, yeah, you have read to write, same group, different group, write to write, same group, different group, uh, write to read, same group, different group. And then all of the like DRDD timings, these aren't relevant in a single rank memory configuration, right? Which like a two by 16 DDR5 setup will generally be, unless you have some incredibly cursed memory sticks. Um, Anyway, and then you have TWR pre, which is relevant, and then you have, like, the power down enable timings, which is debatable as to how relevant they are. Um, oh, and then you have, like, TXP, which is, uh, where is it? There, you have TXP, and then refresh interval uh, per bank, which this also doesn't make, I mean, refresh cycle per bank, which really doesn't make too much of a difference if your refresh interval is high enough. Um... And then you have the round-trip latency timings, but uh, manually trying to tune these is a bad idea. So for these, with Intel 13th Gen, you turn on the round-trip latency uh, training option in the BIOS, and either your round-trip latencies get better and your stability doesn't go down the drain, or your round-trip latencies get better and your stability does go down the drain. If it does go down the drain, you turn that option off, and <laughs> you, you just kind of move on with your life. Um, but when it comes to, like, the actual memory speed, like, this, this is a nightmare to dial in. Like, there's not actually that many timings, like, and for some of them, like, you can't run a TRRD DG of less than seven. Like, you just can't, um, right? Because this is back-to-back -back read operations. You, you can't, you can't send another read command until your first read command is finished, and each read command takes eight, eight cycles. So actually, the fact that you can even set it to seven doesn't really make sense, but I think it has something to do with from what part of the read command the timing is actually measured. So that doesn't, you know, that's fine. Um, it's also possible that the memory controller is internally rounding that value up to eight. Um, the Intel documentation doesn't really tell you exactly how each timing is Im actually implemented. It does tell you, like, hey, this is, like, a valid range of values that you can punch in, but, um, yeah, I'm, I haven't looked into finding, like, timing diagrams specifically for how the Intel memory controller, uh, implements each timing. I'm not even sure that they exist, um, because I've not stumbled across them for any Intel memory controller yet, so maybe I also haven't looked hard enough, but... Anyway, so, you know, yeah, like, timings make a difference, memory speed kinda doesn't, and high memory speeds on Intel 13th gen are absolute nightmare fuel in terms of stability. Um, and so I am just not gonna... Yeah, I'm not gonna be making a video about DDR5-8000, um, cause, like, I have sunk way too much time and effort and resources and, and patience and just, like, I... Like, and it doesn't even make a bloody performance difference. Like, I just can't anymore. It, it's just like, like, I've spent literally since the, like, basically since Z790 launched, I've sunk so many hours into dealing with the fact that the Intel memory controller, once you start going, like, even at seven, like, depending, again, and it, like, you know, I've also tried on, like, four DIM motherboards. Like, I have a Z790 Aorus Master. I've tried running, like, 7600 on that board very unsuccessfully. Um, and, you know, each of these, like, attempt, each of these unsuccessful attempts, like, it takes hours upon hours to come to the conclusion, like, oh, yeah, this is just not gonna work, and I should just give up. And it doesn't make a performance difference anyway, so why am I wasting my time on this? Um, yeah. Um, so, there. That's that's my uh, my rant about the Intel 13th gen memory controller because it's just awful. Um, and, you know, the easiest way to get any mem high memory speed stable is to just ignore some stress tests. Like, I know people who literally, va like, th they validate their memory overclocks by just running test mem5. If I just ran test mem5, then right now I'd be making a video about how this DDR5-8000 is stable. Um, I could have made that video multiple times at this point. 
Except I don't like the 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 other thing is like I don't daily an Intel system currently. Um, I don't really want to daily an Intel system. They pull a ton of power, and my daily system so far has like I like having my daily system on air cooling. I don't particularly feel like switching over to a custom loop just so I can run a three hundred watt CPU. Um, so <laughs> like I don't want a daily an Intel thirteenth gen. And so, you know, with, like, the Ryzen systems, well, no, they're, like, they're just very stable. Like, the, 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 those settings are, like, like, literally the settings I've shown for, for Ryzen 7000 in terms of memory overclocks, like, they're regularly stress tested harder than my daily system. And so, like, those are, like, this is literally tested to higher standards than what I daily. I have absolute faith in that. And then there's the Intel system where it's like, but like this, this will potentially crash in some stress test within seconds for reasons I don't understand. So it's like, but is it actually stable? Like if I was using this every day, would it randomly crash? Maybe, maybe not. Would it uh, randomly corrupt your data? Would it brick windows? Which is a very real risk with unstable memory overclocks. That isn't really as much of a risk with a unstable CPU overclock. Like, um, I've done, you know, question... Like, the OSs that I use on the test benches, like, I don't really care about them. If I break them, I just reinstall. But, um, like, I've done things like installing GPU drivers with unstable memory overclocks. The end result of doing something like that is... Like, well, the easy fix is to reinstall the entire operating system at that point, you know? And sometimes Windows 10 and, like, Windows 10 and probably Windows 11, I've not really used Windows 11 at all, um, like, will just die if you run really unstable memory settings on it, or even slightly unstable memory settings on it for long enough. It will just break which is not something that I've ever encountered with, like, Windows 7 or older Windows operating systems. The, for, somehow they, they survive just incredible amounts of abuse. But the more modern Windows installs, like, yeah, they, they just kind of break if you run them with unstable settings for long enough. And, and I don't want to make videos where I share, you know, test methodologies and guidelines where it's like, I can't guarantee that this is going to work. Because I am, I am very clearly seeing various stress tests crashing. And Wycruncher VST isn't even that hot. Um, like, it really isn't. Um, it's, it runs less hot than Linpack. It runs less hot than Prime95 small FFTs. I don't consider it like a absurdly hot memory stress test. It is very hard on the memory controller. It is incredibly hard on the memory controller. Um... But, you know, like, with something like Prime95 small FFTs, I'm willing to sort of accept that, okay, my daily system can't run Prime95 small FFTs, because the thing that makes sm small FFTs so incredibly hot is that it runs entirely out of the L3 cache. It is a all-core workload that runs entirely out of the L3 cache of the CPU. That's why it's so hot. Um, and that is very unrealistic, if you think about it, because most all-core workloads will be something like uh, video encoding, right? Or rendering a 3D scene. And the data set that such a workload will be working with probably doesn't fit in the L3 cache of the CPU, right? So it's just not going to have the ability to light up all of the AVX execution units on your CPU with 100% uptime. And also, like, Prime95 small FFTs isn't a memory stress test, right? Like, it, it, like not being stable in that doesn't indicate that your memory controller might randomly screw up some transactions uh, every 10 hours and potentially break your operating system by doing that, right? Um, and so, yeah, like, I am, I am just done with this. Um, I hate the 13th gen memory controller, mostly because it's impossible to guarantee that it's stable, in my experience, because it just... Like, the, the, the moment I think, like, okay, it passed Y-Cruncher, it passed test mem 5 I'm just going to run HCI overnight, it's not going to error out, right? And then I come back to it, and there's two errors. And so I start a new instance, and I get more errors, and this time faster. How is the stability, like, progressively getting worse? 
over time. It's like it gets less stable the longer the CPU is running. Um, and, and yeah, and so, like, I, I can't make videos with settings where it's like, oh, it'll randomly break people's operating system. Like, that's just, you know, I have no problem with making videos about, like, settings where it's like, oh, this is only stable for Geekbench. If you actually try to stress test it, it's just gonna, like, you wouldn't daily this, right? Like, I enjoy, like, memory, like, like, hardware bot style memory overclocking where it's like, there's this benchmark that we're running, and I need the system to just finish this benchmark. That's fun. That's fine. You know, that's, that's totally cool. But if I'm gonna make a video where it's like, oh, yeah, this, uh, th this is stable... And it's like, well, is it? That's not fine, right? And I don't see the, like, I don't see the utility in producing a video where it's like, yeah, th these memory settings are stable, except if you run like a memory stress test for 10 hours straight. If you run a memory stress test for 10 hours straight, it eventually gets two errors. So like, it's not actually stable, but maybe you don't care about your data integrity that much. Maybe you're willing to reinstall Windows every six months or something. Um, maybe you're fine with getting random blue screens. I don't know. I don't, they, like, it's not my system, right? But I'm not going to give people recommendations where it's like, I don't know what it's going to do. I, like, I don't, I don't feel like that's a good thing to do. Um, so, yeah. Um, like, 13th gen, the, the memory control, and also you have, like, so much variance between the CPUs. Like, I have a 13900K that's just terrible. Absolutely terrible. I've never seen it do anything above 7200. In fact, I've never run full, like, a full set of stress tests at 7200 with that CPU. Um... Like... You know... That's, that's great. <laughs> that's confidence-inspiring. Um, and so this video isn't really meant to be like a... Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't overclock your memory. Like, my daily system is overclocked. I can, you know, it's stress-tested to um, my usual memory stress-testing standards, which is like, it runs Linpack, it runs HCI mem test. I haven't tried Wycrunch or VST on it. It's a Ryzen 3000. I don't think VST is going to be that harsh on it. Um, because that, that's, like, the funny thing, like, Wycrunch or VST on, like, Ryzen 7000 is trivial to pass. Like, I've really not had issues with Ryzen 7000 running Wycrunch or VST. Um, and I kind of suspect it's just down to, like, differences in the memory controller and, like, core design. Like, I'm, I would not be surprised if Wycrunch or VST just runs significantly faster on Intel CPUs, which means that it puts way more stress on the memory controller and the memory controller just kind of collapses under it. Um, on Ryzen CPUs, it probably can't run as fast, and so the memory controller, like, it, it, it's not significantly harder than something like HCI Memtest or something, um, is, is my suspicion for why it is that, like, Intel CPUs, you run Wycrunch or VST, and they just, like, on a lot of motherboards, it just crashes within seconds once you reach, you know, higher memory speeds. Um, which is not a good sign, because that means if some developer, you know releases an applicate like a game or something where they have a really highly optimized whatever and it hammers the memory controller it's like the game will just crash right that's the point of stress testing is like you run worst case scenario workloads so that if somebody has some crazy optimized physics al algorithm or compression algorithm or decompression like whatever you can run it con with confidence that it won't cause the cpu to error out um, and, like, Intel 13th gen, once you push the memory speed high enough, doesn't fill me with confidence. It fills me with anxiety, because it keeps erroring out at, like, mo when I least expect it. Eight hours into a stress test, after passing everything else. Like, or ten hours. Like. <laughs> so, yeah, um, now this video is way, way longer than it needs to be, but, like, I... Like, I, I'm just so annoyed at this. Because I've put so much time and effort into this. And it just doesn't get better. At all. And, and like, really, you know... As long as you have, like, a 1DIM per channel motherboard... We're going to bring back the calculator. 
Right? If you have a one DIMM per channel motherboard, and your CPU isn't complete trash, 7600 is generally very easy to do. And 8000 is not easy to do. At all. And 8000 divided by, like, the difference between 8000 and 7600 is literally 5%. So even if you had a workload that is literally just peak memory bandwidth, again, peak memory bandwidth doesn't actually translate to most real-world applications, but there are certain things like that, that do scale almost entirely with just memory bandwidth. Um, and so in that scenario, you might see as much as a 5% performance improvement. Um, at best, 5%. Well, for, like, an absolute nightmare of just stability testing. Um, yeah. So, and, and the funny thing is, like, depending on your motherboard and CPU, even 7200 is regularly going to be difficult to do, which, you know, like, yeah, the difference between 8000 and, and 7200, like, that, that starts being significant, right? That's, like, 11%. I mean, if you actually look at real, like, gaming applications, it's not really much of a difference, because 6,000 and, and uh, 7,200, if you tune the timings, are kind of the same thing in terms of performance. But, uh... Yeah. Um, like, I'm... I'm done. Like, this, this, is, this is a waste of time and effort, and electricity, and, I mean... Actually, for me, it's not even a waste of electricity. I have electric heat in my flat, so... <laughs> so, why Cruncher crashing on a semi-regular basis is like, well, I don't have to run the heating, because why Cruncher's doing it for me. Uh, but yeah, like, this... This isn't like, don't overclock your memory. This is just like... Thir like, Intel 13th Gen memory control, like, it's a pain. And if you don't want to waste like, ridiculous amounts of time on negligible performance gains, just drop the memory speed and worry about the time, and, and, and then tune the timings a bit. You don't even need to do anything particularly impressive with the timings, because, like, th th that's the other thing, is, like, the last 1% of performance requires, like... 20 times more effort than the first, like, 90%. Like, it, it is very much an exponential, like, effort, amount of effort that you need to put in for the last, you know, couple percentage points of performance gain. And, and, and I should point out, like, if you can tell the difference between 100 FPS and 105 FPS, you have, like, superhuman perception capabilities because, um... Like, I would generally say that, like, most people probably can't tell the difference between, like, 100 and 110 FPS. Um, so, yeah. Or, like, 60 and 66 FPS. Like, that's that's generally... And that's a 10% difference, right? Um, so, if you're, like, putting in hours upon hours upon hours to get 5% more peak memory bandwidth, which again probably won't even translate to general to a general five percent performance increase. Probably translate to more like a one percent performance increase. You're wasting your time. Like, and I don't know how you're ever going to guarantee that your system won't actually crash. Because I have seen a lot of like screenshots where people have like eighty two hundred, but they only ran test mem five, or eighty eight hundred, and they only ran HCI mem test. Or the 8400, but they only, like, they only ran one stress test. Not all of the stress tests. And so it's like, yeah, um, like, I mean, like, it's their system. So if they don't, like, if they're happy with that level of stability, that's cool. But I am not going to make a video where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is stable when it's like, it's not actually like i don't know that it's stable i don't think it's stable i'm you know i'm doubting it's if i'm doubting its stability i'm not going to go and tell you that it's freaking stable um especially when like lowering the memory speed by two percent five percent will drastically improve the stability and barely change the performance right so yeah Anyway, I, I'll just end the video here because this really isn't 
isn't going nowhere. It's just like, yeah, I give up. Um, DDR5-8000 on, in, or, well, anything north of, like, 6800 is potentially going to be very difficult. 6800 has worked for me even with the Potato Grade 13900K on random Z690 motherboards. But everything above that become, like, depending on how bad the CPU is and how bad the motherboard is, it gets harder and harder and harder. And even if you have a really good CPU on what should be a really good motherboard, if your mounting pressure isn't just right, or if the, like, it probably, like, it's just, I'm done. I am so done. Um, I, like, I, this, it's just, no. So, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, that's it for the video. Um, thanks for watching, I guess. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing here with the channel, there's... Patreon and a band camp and a Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And there's links to all of that down in the description. So yeah, that's that's it for the video. Thank you for watching and goodbye.